All right, so we're going to start studying representation theory. Before that, we'll actually discuss the history a little bit. At least we'll discuss the first start of representation theory, because once I had a special topics class in graduate school from my PhD advisor who lectured from notes from her PhD advisor, and I have to copy the start of that lecture. It starts with, in 1896, Dedekind writes a letter to Frobenius. So, of course, remember there's no email back then, so it's very common for mathematicians to correspond by mail, so they often wrote letters involving lots of mathematics. And so what were in the contents of this letter? Well, he was concerned with the following problem. You let G be a finite group. See, G1 through Gn. And you have a set of indeterminates. So these are variables. One corresponding to each element of the group. And then you consider the following matrix. The ijth entry of the matrix is xg sub i times g sub j inverse. So for instance, we'll take the dihedral group on four, I mean on two things. So this is the Klein four group. Chosen because it's a little easy to work with for the purposes of calculations, because um, ng1 here is the identity. So in the Klein-4 group, every element is its own inverse, and the product of g um, i times gj is gk. So that makes these calculations a little easier. So the first row, the identity element times anything is the anything, so you have x g1, x g2, x g3, x g4, x g2, x g3, x g4. Okay, in this case you're going to just get the Cayley table because gj inverse is just gj, but in general you're going to get something different. So second row, g, uh, g2 squared is the identity element. g2 times g3 is g4. Next g3. Xg2, xg1, xg4. And by symmetry, well, there are typos already. Not surprisingly, that should be a G4, and that should be a G2. So G3, G2, and G4. I mean G1. And so there's our matrix. And so what was Dedekind doing? Well, he was factoring the determinant. So it's a... your... Um, Entries are variables, so the determinant is going to be a polynomial. Let's take a moment to stop and admire the fact that he was doing this by hand in 1896 with much larger examples than this, because he was also doing it for some non-abelian groups. But what he saw was that when G was abelian, he could describe the factors. When g was abelian, this thing would factor into linear terms, which means that each factor would only have degree one terms. So you'd have some sort of coefficient in front of xg1 plus some coefficient times xg2, 
etc. And not only that, he actually could figure out exactly what these coefficients were. So there ended up being exactly n factors in this product. And each one corresponded to a unique homomorphism from your group to the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. And he's able to prove that there are always exactly n such things, and each one corresponded to one of these factors. So his question to Frobenius was to try to figure out what happened when g was not abelian. So when he had looked at some examples, he saw that sometimes you would get larger factors, like actual quadratic terms. And so Frobenius worked on it, and then Frobenius wrote three different papers, and the three different papers created a field of study called character theory which is now viewed as a part of representation theory, as we'll see in a later lecture. And it completely answered this question of how you can factor the determinant of this matrix. So there's the start of, our sub of the subject. You'll sometimes find this in mathematics. The origin of a subject is some sort of very particular math problem, rather than some sort of broad, abstract thing. And yet you'll discover in a moment the actual theory we're going to study is some broad abstract thing. So what is a representation? First off, let's fix the field K. Throughout these lectures, we're going to assume it's going to be characteristic zero. Uh, it's up to you if you want to think about what happens to the proofs when it's not characteristic zero. I can tell you certain theorems end up being false. And I know pretty well which ones are, but that's going to be simple enough for our purposes. And so maybe I'll add other provisions later. And of course, in case you've don't remember ring theory very well. Characteristic is supposed, characteristic zero means that um, nx is not zero for all n in the integers and all elements in your field. Where nx is defined to be what happens when you add the number to itself n times. And fields are sets where you can add and multiply that satisfy a bunch of axioms. In general, it's good enough to just assume that we're working with rational numbers, real numbers, or complex numbers. But it's worth pointing out for some applications that I've had to work with before, the field is actually rational functions. So sometimes you need something more general. Then remember, once you have a field, the set of matrices, the invertible matrices over the field forms a group. Well, given any other group, a representation, also known as a linear representation, is nothing more than a homomorphism from G to a linear, general linear group over the field. The idea is that you're replacing a group or replacing group elements with matrices.
note here that I'm only working with finite dimension or n by n matrices, so it's not actually clear that the representations always exist. I mean, you could always take the map that sends everything to the identity matrix. So in that sense, representations always exist. But if you want something non-trivial, it's not always clear. And that's actually a hard problem. Uh, representation is faithful if it's injective. And a group is called linear if it has a faithful representation. So not every group has a faithful representation. We'll see finite groups have to, but infinite groups might not. So this is... Um, Contrast to earlier in the semester when we talked about Cayley's theorem that there was definitely a homomorphism from any group to a symmetric group on a set. It was not always the case that this set was finite. And that was true if and only if G was a finite group. So every group, finite group was isomorphic to a finite permutation group. But once you got to infinite groups, you had to deal with infinite permutation groups, which are almost impossible to deal with. But infinite groups might be linear. So the point is, with representation theory, you can still work with infinite groups because you're working with n by n matrices, which are somehow still reasonable to work with. However, unfortunately, I do have to point out there are, in fact, groups that are not linear out there. And for those ones, well, those ones are really hard to work with because then you really don't even have matrices. All right, let's start looking at some examples of representations. So first, there's always a silly representation where you send every element to the identity matrix. This is going to be called the trivial representation. It's actually a pretty important one in the theory, so it's important to know that it exists. So then the next example the notes I'm following does involves a group of order two, but instead, well, Let's just look at GL1. These are one by one invertible matrices. So this is also known as non-zero complex numbers. So if you want a representation, let's look at a cyclic group. So what's a cyclic group look like? Well, that's just Z mod NZ. So I'm just gonna look at Z mod NZ. Let's consider representations from C mod NZ. To GL1 or non-zero complex numbers. Well, what's the feature going to have to be? Take the generator here, one. V of one bar to the nth power. Well, it's going to be phi of n times 1 bar, because it's a homomorphism. That's phi of n bar, which is phi of 0, which has to be the identity. So if you take the nth power of the image of this map, you're going to get the identity. So this tells you that phi of 1 bar is an nth root of unity, because the nth power is 1. And it turns out it's well known. The nth root of unity, roots of unity are e to the 2 pi i over n as i ranges from 
1 up to n. Notice I'm not saying primitive nth root of unity, I'm just saying nth root of unity. It's actually even 0. So phi of 1 bar has to be equal to one of these. So that tells you phi of j has to be equal to e to the 2 pi i j over n. So we're going to use i here to indicate which of the i's we're working with. So for representations of the cyclic group, we've got a whole bunch of them, one for every nth root of unity. All right, as another example, let's take the dihedral group, symmetry group of the regular n-god. Um, you can view this as acting on the plane because it's rotations and reflections. So since it's rotations and reflections, the rotation of order n acts on R2 as cosine of 2 pi over n, cosine of 2 pi over n, sine of 2 pi over n. A negative sine of 2 pi over n. One way to actually see this is to see what it does to the standard basis vectors. That if you multiply by r, you will get exactly what you're supposed to. What happens when you rotate both these by exactly theta degrees? I mean theta radians. And actually the way I have these formulas written, this is clearly the clockwise rotation. And here theta is 2 pi over n. If you multiply this first row by the vector 1, 0, you will see that you actually do get the x-coordinate being cut being cosine and the y-coordinate being negative sine, and the y-coordinate is negative. And likewise, if you multiply 0, 1 by this matrix, you will get the correct coordinates, that the x-coordinate is a sine and the y-coordinate is a cosine. Likewise, the other matrix corresponding to the reflection, what does a reflection do? It swaps the role of x and y, and so the corresponding matrix transformation is this one. And so these two matrices correspond to reflection and rotation, and since the dihedral group is generated by these two matrices, this actually defines a homomorphism and a representation. At least that's what the book says. I say that's kind of disingenuous because you could actually argue that this is the definition of the dihedral group depending on your perspective. But traditional treatments define the dihedral group as a permutation group. So from that perspective, this is in fact a representation. So that's a two-dimensional representation. But since we're here, what about the one-dimensional representations to the complex numbers? So we already discussed r has to have order n again, so we see that phi of r is definitely going to have to be a complex root of unity again for some i. But what about s? Well, s is going to have to be uh, either plus or minus 1. So there's two n possible one-dimensional representations for the dihedral group.
that's it for me for starting examples. The notes I'm looking at also does the quaternion group, but I think I'll hold off on the quaternion group till we do more examples because I would like to do all, a lot more with the quaternion group all in one go.